We're supposed to give ourselves to God. You know, when you give God your heart, the rest goes with it. Hello, and welcome back to Crosstalk International. My name is Elijah Weiss, and this episode is part two of an ongoing series. Crosstalk has recently reached the milestone of 50 years of ministry, and that milestone has led me to do an investigation to answer the question, what is the legacy of Crosstalk? And I'm taking you with me as I explore this. In the last episode, I sat down with my Zadie, Dr. Randy Weiss, and asked him about how his ministry began. To do a quick recap for you, he told me that he started doing ministry pretty much as soon as he got saved back in the 70s. If you missed that episode, you can find it on our YouTube channel. We post all of our programs there, and I highly encourage you to check it out. Today, we are going to pick up where we left off with my grandfather. At this point in the story, he's newly married and a new believer. He read a book that talked about Jesus, and as a result, he got saved and completely turned his life around. Okay, let's jump right in. You had said um, ministry is just walking through faith and letting Jesus be the light in your life. So for you, how were you, because um, I know your life was changed. You said you're, you were born again, and clearly you were born again, and your life was transformed. How did that reflect in your regular life? Because I know with, with Grammy and with you know what you were doing in life, how did you start the mission of, okay, I'm living through faith, but this is what I'm called to do through faith. Well, when I came to know Jesus, I couldn't help myself but to sing about His love and write songs about His love. Whatever, if I were a painter, I would have painted stuff of faith. I happened to be a, a musician, a songwriter. Uh, and so I started doing the only thing I knew how to do to declare what I was learning about my God. And that maybe made it somewhat interesting to some people. And so, the, you know, some guy came to our little apartment, wanted to sell us insurance, you know. You know, you're a, you're a married man now, you know, you have responsibility to have a life insurance policy. So, you know, you get hit by a bus that, uh, you know, your wife's not out on the street. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, well, how do you do this? And so I let the guy come and talk to me about I should buy some inexpensive life insurance policy because that's what a married man's supposed to do. I didn't know anything. And I let him talk to me about insurance and then I talked to him about Jesus. And he was like, oh, I'm a Christian too. And so then he wanted to talk about Jesus. And, uh, oh, well, will you come and share your testimony at my church and sing your songs at my church? Okay. And so when you start talking to people about Jesus, doors open up. And that's how it happened. And, but there's opportunities everywhere to share the love of God because people everywhere, you, you can't go... If you're paying attention, there's hurting people. There's families that have problems. There's challenges that people face. And, you know, when I came to faith, I, I learned Christ is the answer. <laughs> okay? Well, if Christ is the answer, when people have challenges, we'll point them to the answer. We can't fix most stuff but we can point them to the fixer of most stuff. Yeah. So in that process, because I, I continued writing songs for the Lord and uh, I had, been, I had op, you know, I'd operated a little recording studio before I knew the Lord and I just started using this little recording studio for the Lord because everything we're supposed to, give ourselves to God. And our talents, our resources, you know, when you give God your heart, the rest goes with it. And I just started doing what I was capable of doing. I did the best I could with what I had to work with. It wasn't that good, but it was the best I could do. 
with what I had to work with. Very quickly. Um, and by the way, I should mention, I thought I was the only Jewish person in the whole world who believed in Jesus. I had no idea that there was another Jew anywhere who had ever believed in Jesus. Nobody had told me that Jesus was Jewish. <laughs> Nobody had told me the disciples were Jewish. Nobody had told me that everybody that wrote the Bible, <laughs> I just didn't know. And so I had a friend, first guy I did LSD with. Uh, we were very good friends. This was like 1968. And we stayed friends, okay? And uh, around the same time I came to faith and was called to the ministry, he came to faith. And he was also called to the ministry independently. And we, I don't even remember how we reconnected, but somebody told him that I had come to faith. And he was like so shocked. And he called me up and we got together. And God did something. He said, you need to meet my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law is Jewish and he believes in Jesus. And it was like, <laughs> there's another one. <laughs> When I heard that, I said, I want to meet him, please. So he introduced me to his brother-in-law. He told me, after we met, there's, you're Hungarian and you're a musician. I know a Hungarian who's a musician, who loves Jesus. You need to meet him. I said, oh, I would love to. And he introduced me to the man who mentored me in ministry. And his friend was, the, was a pastor and the, the head of Christian Ministries International. And he was working with the underground church. He had escaped from Hungary. And God had called him to reach his people. Coincidentally, my people, my father was from Hungary. And we were both musicians and we immediately began. I didn't understand it, but in retrospect, he was like a Paul. And he allowed me to be a Timothy. And he brought me into his ministry and allowed me to go preach the gospel and God made a partnership in ministry for which I will forever be thankful because in 1973 and 1974 and 1975 and probably all the way until about, till the fall of the Iron Curtain, even though our ministries sort of went in some different directions over the years, we continued working together as partners in the gospel for the cause of Christ in different parts of the world together. Um, the early trips that I've heard about many times where you would load up in the RV and you'd go, those trips, how did they start? Like, what, what was the, the purpose of them? Well, it was just a burning desire to tell people about Jesus. And, you know, early on, I would use our music as kind of the vehicle the entree to whatever forum I could access to be able to go sing my little songs and talk about Jesus. And that's sort of been the heart of this ministry from the beginning. I, I sing my little songs and talk about Jesus. Now over the years that has changed, but in the early years, m music was foundational to what we did and the songs that I wrote and continue to write uh, were an integral part of how our ministry functioned. I mean, I don't mean financially, I just mean 
that's how I saw myself in ministry. It was doing these ministry concerts and sharing my testimony and preaching the gospel and trying to help point people to, to Jesus. Um, so the trips were often organized around uh, whether they were going to, if there was, if there was a TV station there that would, uh, there were TV stations that would invite me to do the ministry, do what I do, teach what I teach, preach what I preach. There were radio stations that would uh, allow me to share their platforms. There were churches and I never cared how big or how small. And that was, that was also, I think, very important because we, we found ourselves uh, preaching in houses, in garages, uh, in workshops. It didn't matter. I always find it interesting to look back and see how God has worked in the past. We're going to continue exploring the early days of traveling ministry, but we're going to add a few new people to the conversation. I figured it would be cool to get the perspective of a few of my grandfather's children. After all, they were along for the ride too. What you're about to see is sort of a roundtable discussion between my grandfather, my grandmother, my mom and dad, and my Uncle Caleb and Aunt Jen. My dad and Uncle Caleb have been a part of the TV side of Crosstalk since they were my age. I also sat down with them individually, which you will see in a moment. The story you're about to hear is very unique, so stick with us. So I, I know that uh... I know that the ministry started obviously much earlier than us and our siblings, but for us, it kind of started on those summer trips. I mean, every year we would, you know, from the time we got out of school, you would subject us to the torture. That's what it felt like, right? You would subject us to the torture of loading up in this little tiny RV. Now people like glorify tiny homes and stuff. We lived in a tiny home all summer long every year growing up. How many times did you pick us up at school and drop us back off at school? Yeah, it's like, it, yeah, you, 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 your summer was basically spoken for, but I'm curious, what exactly did we do on those summer trips? We went around and told people about Jesus and the love of God. These early trips that you guys did when you were a kid, going all across the country, all across uh, the world even, going across the borders and stuff, from your perspective, what were you guys doing? Being subjected to cruelty. <laughs> That's what I felt like when I was growing up. Obviously, when we're on the trips, you know, your your family grows really close when you're in close quarters. You know, there's eight of us. I have five brothers and sisters, and like if you <laughs> if you saw some of the configurations of how we all slept in the RV. You're packed into a little, a little RV, right? It started off with the ones with like the class A with the, the bed over top of the driver, you know, the cab. And then as, as we got more and more people in the family, we kind of graduated to larger RVs, but they only get so big. So like these summer trips, they were somewhat of an adventure because you're, you're camping, you're packing up everything every day, you know, the beds and everything going back. And then you're driving, you're going to churches, you're going to TV stations, you're going to, to revival camps or tent meetings. Um, and then of course, you're having fun too. Uh, as a kid, you don't really appreciate all of the experiences that you're gathering. But after I graduated, you look back and it's like, wow, we actually had a pretty great pretty great upbringing, being able to experience the world and draw closer together as a family, uh, and do ministry. And um, I don't know, it's somewhat contributed to the crazy that I am today. So when we went on the summer trips though, and we loaded up in the RV, I know they were always ministry trips. We obviously had a great childhood and upbringing, being able to go camping and seeing, you know, I, I tell people often that by the time I graduated high school, I'd been to like every state in the US six times minus Hawaii and pretty much every province in Canada. And it wasn't just because of glamorous, you know, travels. It was, it was ministry. So maybe 
what were some of the things? I know we went to TV stations and radio stations and churches and camps and stuff, but maybe share some of those. Well, uh, a lot of it uh, focused around uh, Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship banquets. I spoke at banquets around North America and test- gave testimony, and we, uh, you know, we did little our ministry concerts and. Uh, Matt Nichols was the man who mentored me in ministry in uh, 73, 74, and he, uh, w- w- we started with uh, CMI, Christian Ministries International. CM uh, was the ministry that Nat had founded, and uh, Nat had gotten saved in the late 60s. He had uh, escaped from Hungary. He was part of the Hungarian Revolution, actually. I, I remember, though, uh, so I know, obviously, I know that. I know that you know two of those summers when we were doing those ministry trips, we went over to uh, Europe and did stuff behind the Iron Curtain. I, you know, I knew it was, I knew it was serious because I remember all the talks about what we're not allowed to do or say or <laughs> how quiet we had to be. When I started working with Nat, most of the work that we were doing was for the underground, but we were initially doing it in the states. The, but when you say the underground, it was. Before the fall of the Iron Curtain, right, and it was illegal to be, right. you know, having churches and doing out, out, outward worship and stuff, right? In communist nations, God was the government and science. Our God, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, was the greatest enemy the communists had. Because if somebody believed in Jesus, if they believed in what the Bible says of, about God, then all of a sudden, the communist government lost its power in the lives of the people who were submitted to a higher power. And, you know, and of course, like in, at that time, you know, people in Russia, for example, if they said they wanted to leave Russia, they were considered insane. There were Jews who wanted to go to Israel. Why would someone want to leave Mother Russia? They must be mentally imbalanced, and so they'd end up in insane asylums or in Siberia. Well, we never went to Russia. No, we worked. We had a lot of work in Russia, but our work was, uh, we produced the first New Testament Psalms and Proverbs on cassette in Russian for distribution uh, in Ukraine and Russia and different areas of that part of the world. I, I remember that, that was Dimitri. That was with Dimitri. Yeah. That was here in the States, though. We produced it here. The Russian materials we did, though, was after our travels to Yes. Europe. After. And when we were there, you weren't participating in the rallies. You were doing home churches and right. and smuggling. I mean, I remember right. the purposes we were there. We You loaded that RV up and with I, I couldn't even tell you what it was. I mean, I mean Bibles, I know. Right, but I don't think we really knew. We had a perception. It was all, it was all contraband, and it was Christian, faith-based contraband. Some of it was your stuff. Some of it, I assume, was Bibles. And right, the uh, it was not my intention to do that. It became a request of Nats. We were producing m- many materials. Uh, we, we were. In 1975, we converted the downstairs of our home into a recording studios, and we were recording Hungarian language radio programs and Hungarian language Christian teaching programs that were being beamed in from Transworld Radio. Shortwave radio. Uh, Yeah, and uh, um, Monte Carlo. Uh, we had regular programs going in and we, you know, we started making, you know, single copies of tapes and then dual copies of tapes and we followed the technology to where we could, you know, begin doing duplicating when duplicators became available and we would work with smugglers to bring the materials to the underground. Were we taking them or were you getting them there? Both, I think. We were, we were recording them in America we were duplicating them, and then we were smuggling them in. I had told mom before we left that we weren't going to say anything to any of you kids because we felt that anything you knew, you might blab. 
because kids just blab. And we didn't know how we were gonna do what we were supposed to do. And I didn't want to be foiled. I didn't want to fail because of some foolish thing some child said, not realizing how detrimental it could be. And I was just very sensitive that I didn't want you guys to get us arrested with accidentally talking about things that you just didn't need to say. And at the same time, we've always tried to shelter you and keep you from when you were little, not knowing what was happening, if it was potentially dangerous or bad or awkward or uncomfortable, because we want you to be happy. And there was no need to, I don't know, upset you guys. Just curiously, was this the first or the second time we went? That was the first time. So 80, 83, 84, something yeah, like that? Yeah, and we had no preparation. There was no, because Every, everything, everything was new at that trip. Right. We were completely blind. The second trip would have been a little different because right. you had an expectation. Yeah, and we didn't know any of our contacts, except on the free world side, they couldn't, there was a message that was sent ahead some months earlier into Hungary to the to the underground that and it was all cryptic, like an angel with, you know, the initial B is gonna be in whatever the village was in June, you know, just some cryptic thing. And it actually meant Randy's gonna be there in December. I, and I wasn't involved in how they coded what they coded. All I knew was whenever, and it was presumed we were going to successfully be able to cross the border with the materials we were smuggling in. I remember the border crossings. Yeah. Where we took away, I think it was Jamie's blanket. Yeah, make him cry. <laughs> you gotta tell that story. <laughs> and I don't remember which border crossing it was. I just remember the events as you've probably crossed a border into Canada or some other place in a vehicle uh, in your lifetime. Typically you end up in a queue and you're waiting in line for your turn to speak to the border guard or to the border agent. And you have to remember, we didn't speak the language, so there was gonna be that challenge to begin with. Um, but as we neared the border crossing, I remember dad uh, telling uh, one of us to take away my brother's, my, my youngest brother Jamie's blanket. Now his blanket was like his teddy bear, it was his security item, it was the one thing that would calm him. And I think in dad's mind it was, if you have a crying child in this car, nobody wants to be around a crying child. And if the security officer comes in the RV to inspect, which was anticipated, they won't want to stick around. And hopefully they'll be blinded to the things they need to be blinded to. And uh, that, in fact, is what happened. And that's just one small little event that as a child, I can connect the dots with. And I can say, yeah, we knew more than probably they wanted us to know. Um, but I also understand that there were greater risks that as a child, we couldn't contemplate. And as a parent now, I can appreciate the things that you might keep from a child. Um, because as dad implied, loose lips sink ships, you know. That, that was the first crossing. There were multiple crossings and we had things going for different countries. But <clears throat> that first crossing was to a village where we were going to a, 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 a village in, in Hungary. And all we knew was that there was a man named Shandor that we were supposed to connect with. And he was gonna be our contact for the next connections. But we had no idea. We didn't know his full name. We didn't have an address. We, so where'd you go? Sorry, where'd we go? Yeah, well, we, it was night when we finally made it to the, this little village community and we had just stopped and we had prayed because 
we didn't know where we were going. We didn't know what we were supposed to do next because everything hinged on us getting to Shandor. And so sometimes mom would ask me, what are we gonna do? And, and I would have a pretty standard answer, I don't know. <laughs> but then we would pray. And so we stopped and we prayed and we got back on the road and uh, we came to a house that had a porch light on. And I said, I, I think I'm, I have to go and ask somebody. She says, no, you know, I mean, we could get in trouble, you know, or they could get in trouble. I said, I don't know what else to do. And I really felt I was supposed to go to that house where the light was on. And so I pulled over and I went up to the door and I knocked on the door. This is still middle of the night? It, by this, this was the next <laughs> night. Surprise, two in the morning. No, this was the next night and it was dark, but it, it, I mean, it might've been eight o'clock, you know. Um, it took a long time before we got to the border, before we made the crossing and that's uh, craziness all by itself. But when we finally got to this, the correct village, so I went up to the door where the light was on the porch light and I knocked on the door. And I was scared. And, and I just, a man, an older man, he came to the door and uh, I, I, I said, uh, I, I'm from America, I'm looking for Shandor. And he looks at me all confused and puzzled. And he says, uh, Shandor. I said, yes, I'm Randy from America. I'm looking for Shandor. He doesn't speak any English. He says, Shandor. I said, yes, I'm trying to find, I need to see Shandor, which I didn't know. That's just like Steve or Joe. Or, <laughs> you know, I had no idea. So. He says, Shandor. I said, yes, Shandor, I need Shandor. And he says, Shandor. I said, Shandor? He says, Shandor. Shandor? Yes, Shandor. I said, hallelujah. He says, hallelujah. It was Shandor. And so, it was like this amazing, how did that happen situation. I know that was a lot to take in, but I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Try to imagine yourself loading up your family of eight and smuggling materials into communist countries. Some may call them crazy, but ultimately, if you seek to follow God's will wherever it leads, he will bless you in whatever you do. Well, we're out of time for this episode. Luckily, we have plenty more to go, so stay tuned for the next episode. The best way for you to keep up with the series is by following us on all the major social media platforms with the handle at Crosstalk TV and to subscribe to our YouTube channel with the same handle. We'll see you next time. Shalom and God bless.